Real is having a conversation without needing to explain because the people I speak with are open to exploring and understanding. Thank you for tuning into The Real Storytellers. This space was created to allow you to meet some real ones, those engaging in racial and social justice work and to allow you to cultivate your own journey. These members are real, their stories are real, and their work is anchored in everything the real movement represents. Welcome to The Real Storytellers. I am your host, Angel Booz. Today we have a special guest with us, Carmen Torres Izquierdo. Izquierdo. I told her I was going to get her name right and say I, I had to make sure that I got that right. Uh, <laughs> Carmen, welcome to the Real Storyteller space. Um, please tell us who you are and or what you do. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm so looking forward to our conversation today. My name is Carmen Torres Izquierdo. And I am an administrative assistant in the Ocean County office, the Uniserve Region 7 at NJEA. And we're there for all our members. But my most important accomplishment is being a mother of two beautiful young women, Crystal and Lillian. As a single parent, it, as we all single parents will know, it, mm -hmm. it wasn't easy, but I am very proud of all their accomplishments and of their career choices today. Um, my uh, children have been as, I have been as supportive of my children as they have been of me. And so I think that uh, the world is a much better place and I'm being biased because <laughs> of my two children. I am a product of uh, born and raised in Buffalo, New York and made my way downstate to the State University of New York at Binghamton, where I got my degree in history and Latin American studies, and then moved on to nurture and have a family. Um, but prior to that, I started my career down in, in uh, New York City with uh, training programs and things of that sort. So I've done a lot of work in the private sector, but I've also done most of my work in um, nonprofit. And uh, that is what brought me to New Jersey. And I was in New Jersey working with children and students of um, in underserved areas, particularly Puerto Rican or Spanish speaking students with the organization Aspira Inc. of New Jersey, which is a national organization. And I was working at the New Jersey um, affiliate. And then from there, I moved on to NJEA. And so here I am. All right. Well, we're glad to have you. So your rich experience prepared you for everything that you were going to do with NJEA and in your current roles. So clearly, we're, we're happy for all of your prior experience because it made you who you are today. Thank you. <laughs> now, can you share a story about a time when you knew you wanted to get involved in educating the community professionally? Well, I have to say that growing up in Buffalo, the reason Puerto Ricans went to Buffalo in our case uh, is because my grandfather was the reverend of a Pentecostal church. So anyone who grew up in the church knows that you live, breathe, and eat community. And so that, that was my first exposure. I watched my family, my mother, my, my siblings, my cousins, everyone engage in community activism throughout my whole life. So it was just a natural progression to do that um, once I decided I was going to uh, play a role in helping to make this society a bit more productive. And so that that's uh, pretty much it. <laughs> Well, it's right. always been a calling and a want. Well, considering that you said that, I do just want to ask a follow-up question. What has been your most fulfilling role professionally? Oh, my. Um, I, I can't really pinpoint it to one role, but if I had to, I think it would have been my role as a mentor to children in Newark, which is where I was. I started my New Jersey career. Um, our community in Newark at the time was very uh, harsh. Our, our students had uh, two choices. Um, they either um, 
joined gangs or they left. And so working with that community and that population of students was actually amazing for me. I know we did a lot. We had to do a lot of risky things to get them and keep them out of gangs mm -hmm. and then be very creative in finding ways to help them um, realize their potential. And it wasn't as easy as saying, okay, today we're going to do this. No, it was more like, I saw you on the corner. You didn't go to school today. I'm going to get you in my car and you're going back to school. And after that, you're coming to the office. We're going to do homework there. You know, that kind of attitude. And um, they would show up and they would do, often, they would do what we asked them to because we had a lot of incentives for them. And so they wanted to be part of our gang, which was the education, leadership through education. And so I spent a good portion of my career doing that throughout uh, the state of New Jersey. In Vineland, we had communities in Trenton. We had, you know, all our students uh, were part of this one big gang. But this gang, you had to behave, you had to get your education in order, and you had to learn your priorities. But moreover, what we taught them was how to work within the system, how to speak to our political, uh, to our politicians, our political leaders, and and how to also um, research who they are so that when you did meet these, these people, you had some knowledge and background and have a, a good, to have a good conversation with them. And that, was, that to me was the best part, just to watch them flourish, because it was in them all the time. Wow. I, I'm so impressed, uh, Carmen. Mm -hmm. I have to say, because I'm a, a child and a student of the Essex County area, and I grew up in Orange, New Jersey, which borders North, so I'm very familiar with the community in which you were working with. And in addition to that, to hear you put a positive spin on gangs, that's amazing. And, and that, that's <laughs> something encouraging, because the kids all want to be down. You know, They all want to be affiliated with something. Yes. And what they really need most is someone pushing them and holding them accountable to know someone cares. So to have people like yourselves in that position is just, you know, it, it, it doesn't come across often people who genuinely care. So I can hear in just the way you communicated, you know, your role there, how much you really truly connected with those children. So yeah. thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Thank well, you. And, and they're like, you know, everything was reciprocated. You know, so it, it just made it that much more joyous. Yeah, it's fulfilling yeah. to know that you're really mm -hmm. truly good people. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> so in your work as an educator within the community, can you share a story about the moment you became aware that racial equity is critical to our work? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a product of the 70s. I went to school in the 70s. So I've been in this... I don't want to say fight, but struggling for many, many years and always hopeful, always hopeful that I would see changes. And when you do see a change, it's fleeting because you turn around just like the verdict the other day, last week, the verdict was guilty, but by, at the same time, someone was being shot. One of our children was being shot. So it gives you sometimes a sense of hope but also you get frustrated because you turn around and the same thing happens again, you know? So I have always, it's a never present situation. A racial inequity is always, is always there. And the work that we see and we witness throughout our lives is thankfully work that comes from the heart. And we want people to to understand and realize, but you can't change people's minds if that's not what they see, if they don't understand it. And so I think that this work that we're doing now is very, is still very hopeful. Um, and I'm really trying not to lose hope, uh, but there are days when you just, the waters just get murkier and murkier, <laughs> you know? Absolutely, and I completely understand where you're coming from with that because it, it can be very depressing sometimes to continuously repeat the same struggles over and over again, but we have to remain hopeful. Yes. We have to believe that it can do nothing but get better. Um, our belief is that it will not get any worse and it may take time, but I think through um, programs like the real and building connections with people, 
we can truly then try to help them begin to understand so that changes can really be made. Yes. Well, I have to say, I have to add that what what makes me uh, very happy and, and makes me delighted in being able to join in on this work with everyone is that we're talking that teachers like yourself, our educators in the classroom, our ESPs in the building, you know, everyone is, is taking part in it. And when everyone else is taking part in it, you can't help but to feel hopeful and say, okay, I'm in, I'm in. Where do you want me, you know? And, and we learn. So I love the real work that's going on. I really do because it just gives me such a renewed sense of hope. I, I, I agree with you on that. Now, Carmen, <laughs> can you describe your relationship with the real movement? <laughs> well, I have to say, as an NJEA staff person, and we're always uh, defined by our titles and where we fit in and what cog we fit in <laughs> with the organization. But as of, I want to say, well, I've been with the organization a little, just a little short of five years. So in the last three years, I've taken on a larger role because um, we have, as an, as an association, um, uh, decided that we're going to put extra effort into this work because this work needs to happen. If we look at our membership, it reflects, um, it reflects a, a diverse community. So everyone needs to, everything needs to be addressed. So to that end, um, I would go and maybe do the registration and talk a little bit to the members while we're there on, on activities and so forth. But that began to flourish. Um, then there were uh, opportunities to be able to talk about my experience or the experience that I am a part of, which is the Latino experience. You know, because this is this is work that needs to happen in all our communities of color. So I stepped in at that point to um, share the knowledge that I have with our members, and uh, in in a variety of ways through uh, workshops and just conversation in general. So my the the work every day has just grown and grown. And so when when uh, our dear wonderful Gabe. And it makes an ask. It's hard to say no. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say no, but in a in a good way because we know that he's he's putting more on our plate, but in a very positive way. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And who can say no? <laughs> right. <laughs> he asked so nicely. <laughs> he does. He does. Well, Carmen, have you had one or more experiences with the real? that has challenged you or helped you to grow in some type of way? Wow, let's see, I wrote this down because I, I had to think <laughs> about it long and hard. And where is my challenge here? <laughs> okay, my challenges are self-inflicted because I tend to want to, to find solutions and have things happen and make them happen right away. And that's where I, that's my downfall. But let's see, for years, for years, I have been trying to grow and my growth comes from being able to share and on a larger scale with our members. And so I think that that challenge is, like I said, is self-inflicted. Absolutely. And I, I resonate with what you're saying, because when your heart is in something, you want it to work and you put that much more into it. And so everything feels personal, even though it's work. You really take yes. heart of everything you're doing. So I, I completely resonate with that and I understand. And I appreciate you sharing that because I think more of us in our work roles need to connect with things in our lives. Um, because that makes the work just that much more fulfilling. And we actually want yeah. to do it. We want to do it when it's connected to us. Well, it's always, my model has always been when when I go to work and work feels like work, then I need to move on. Mm -hmm. I love that saying. Yeah. I, I yeah. need to apply that to my own life. I think <laughs> some of us need to hear that today. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> 
In thinking of the future, what does it look like and how does the real movement influence that future? Well, I tell you, it, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna stay positive because I see that there's a lot of conversation taking place. I see um, a lot of in in questions being asked by everyone and a lot of learning going on. And that gives me hope. And that's where I see, I see the real movement going. I think it has permeated every part of what we do throughout the day when we take it home and put it through the thought process, hopefully we put it away and be able to get some good sleep, but it creeps up on you. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I, I, I see a lot of change coming and I see a lot of understanding and, and not, and, and as I said, the murky waters begin to clear. And we have had several conversations in group sessions and just individually, one-on-one -on -one conversations where um, I don't think I've ever missed someone saying, oh, I didn't know that. Tell me more. And that feels good and vice versa. I always wanna know, I wanna listen, I wanna understand so that I can be more understanding and I can be a better person. Absolutely. And the real movement has challenged me in that same way. Just being able to hear from other people, uh, learn from their experiences, um, because in our roles as educators in any role as an educator, um, even as a parent, you're always learning. You know, we don't come equipped with all the answers. And so through connections and hearing other people's experiences, we get the opportunity to learn and to grow. And the goal, as you pointed out, is to then apply it to our lives. That's the real work, taking it back and doing something with it. So hopefully the people who are watching are encouraged to take some of their lessons from the real movement as we hope they get involved with it and then apply it in their personal lives and in their lives as an educator. Excellent. I, I, I share that hope. <laughs> now, if you had to create a hashtag, Carmen, for your work, what would that hashtag be? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm I'm a I'm a '70s girl, so <laughs> <laughs> that was a hard one for me. But it made me think about back in the '70s and in the eight, early well early '80s uh, when we were at the university and fighting for a lot of different uh, rights. They in New York, the um, counterparts or the brother uh, organization to the Black Panthers, the Young Lords Party in Manhattan. And the Young Lords Party uh, members used to wear the black berets as well, but on it they had a black pin and when the words written in, one word written in white, and it was palante, which means forward, hashtag palante. And that's what I would use for the work in the real movement. Now in one minute or less, what would you tell me why the real movement is vital right now? Well, I want to start by saying I wish the real movement wouldn't be vital right now because so much work has been put into um, into the, the equity piece throughout many, many years. So that would have been my hope that at this stage of my life, I would see a lot of definite changes. But the real movement right now has to carry on what has begun and the work that needs to still be done. So that's why the real movement now, we have to keep reminding folks because there's always generation after generation of a lot of inequity um, because we can't just change society. Some people are born into it, others develop it throughout a certain time in their lives or through an experience that they've had and then we're back at square one. So the real movement now, what I love is that it has not continued, it has begun, it has continued, and it's now in the classroom. And I think that is key. And I that is what makes me very happy and hopeful that we're gonna see and continue to see a lot more change. I agree with you, I, I think so as well. Now, just in general, do you have any final thoughts that you would like to share? I have thought about many things on how to, many times about how to answer this question. And I don't have one general thought, but I do have one song. 
ain't no stopping us now. <laughs> That's right. We're on the move. Yes. And I, I truly believe that is a great way to close out because I really don't think that this is going to end anytime soon. The real movement is just getting started. Yes. There's no stopping us. No, nope, not at all. All right. So all. Again, I want to take this time to thank you for blessing us with your presence, your yes. knowledge, your experience. We appreciate you and all of the work that you do. And uh, to the audience, to learn more about The Real Movement, visit our website, real.nja.org. And until next time, peace.